Welcome. I'm Lark Mason, and we're delighted that you're here for this late summer presentation by Asia Week New York. We have a real treat this afternoon. First, Asia Week, for all of you who are new, um, is a New York-based association of the top international dealers, museums, auction houses, who love Asian art and get together with programs throughout the year and also in New York each March. We encourage you to come to New York. Nothing could be better to be in New York in March in spite of the weather, but we have fabulous in-person presentations with participation by these fabulous dealers, museums, and other professionals who all gather together and we get a chance to meet and share experiences and our love for this subject. So please check our website for future programs. You can also join to receive updates, our newsletter. We have information that changes each week on the website, announcements, interesting articles, and information about future programs. At the end of today's presentation, we'll have a short conversation between me and our speaker, Becky McGuire. So at this point, I'd like to introduce her. I'm sure you've read information about Becky, her experience as a longtime specialist in Chinese export works of art, working at Christie's, director of exceptional sales. She graduated from University of California at Berkeley, honors in art history, studied at the Victoria and Albert Museum for the Center of Fine and Decorative Arts, was with me one of the original appraisers on PBS Antiques Roadshow and, um, and uh, has been immersed in this field of export works of art. Today, she's, um, she's also a founding partner of the Chinese Porcelain Company in New York City. And we're going to be discussing her recently published book, Four Centuries of Blue and White, the Freilinghausen Collection of Chinese Japanese Export Porcelain. She's also a member of the vetting committee for the Export Works of Art category at the prestigious winter show that occurs each January in Park Avenue, New York, for which also Asia Week has been a contributing member for some absolutely fabulous programs. And we will be doing so again this coming January. So without further ado, well, join me in welcoming Becky McGuire. Thank you so much, Lark, for that wonderful introduction. I'm delighted to be here with all of you this afternoon to share some highlights from uh, our book and some of the wonderful stories that the Freelingheisen Collection tells. And share my screen with you all. The Freelinghausen Collection is extraordinarily large and exceptionally deep. It ranges across four centuries, as we describe in our title, starting with the height of the Ming Dynasty when Europeans first reached Asia by sea, to the last decade of the Qing Dynasty uh, at the start of the 20th century. And it includes wares made for markets from Japan and Southeast Asia, to the Arabian Peninsula, Europe, and America. Reflecting the enduring reach this fine and lustrous material has had all around the globe. Now, a strict focus on blue and white might seem at first to be limiting, but actually because of the ubiquity and the near universal appeal of blue and white, the collection paints a very clear picture of the commercial and cultural exchanges that evolved over its four centuries. And most important, this singular focus inspired acquisitions that ventured far beyond the greatest hits of export porcelain, although there are plenty of those, into some quite fascinating and little studied categories. And so the collection allows us to tell many stories of the ways in which Asian porcelain was traded, collected, lived with, and loved around the world. In this talk, I'll share some of these stories and touch on some of the themes we explore in our book.
We begin with faith. Faith animated the age when Europeans first reached Asia by ship, and it's no surprise that the first Chinese porcelains commissioned by Westerners very often featured Christian decoration. The intrepid Portuguese established an outpost in Malacca on the coast of Malaysia in 1510, having gradually hopscotched from Mombasa to Hormuz to Goa on their way. And almost immediately, they managed to transact for special porcelains from Jing to Jen. Four of the famed first orders, the Portuguese made in the 16th century, display Christian symbols. Two of them interspersed with Portuguese royal emblems, neatly reflecting the mix of church and state power that lay behind the Portuguese voyages. And a few decades later, the Spanish voyages to Asia. This church-state intertwined power was known as the Padroado in Portugal and the Patronato Real in Spain. The little ewer I'm showing you here is the earliest special order piece in the Frelinghuysen collection. And it's painted with a Christian cross impaled with the nails of the passion. You see that on the left. On the other side, a Garuda-like angel sits within a sun motif on the shoulders of that little ewer. This distinctive form of cross is closely associated with Church of the East Christians, often called Nestorians. There has been a Nestorian community in China since the Tang Dynasty, but they were long gone by the time this little ewer was made, when there was, however, a strong Nestorian presence in India, where, of course, the Portugals, Portuguese had established themselves. It seems most likely that a Portuguese merchant in India managed to order this piece from a Chinese trader in Malacca. The big vase at right was made later in the 16th century, part of a group of ewers and vases, many of you will know, decorated with this distinct Baroque style fountain, which echoes the fountain found in many European paintings and tapestries of the period, like the famous unicorn tapestries at the cloisters. Fountains that signify the hortus conclusus or enclosed garden of Mary. But on these porcelains, the unicorn has been replaced by a chi lin. You may be able to see it better on this second magic fountain vase in the collection. By this time, there were Portuguese religious communities in Japan and Spanish ones in the Philippines. And very likely a Portuguese or Spanish church or monastery was the source of these orders. That kind of institutional use would explain the multiple surviving examples and their several different forms. And interestingly, a number of these pieces have been found in Japan. Now, among the early 16th century Europeans to travel to Asia was St. Francis Xavier, whose story is closely tied to this vase. It was made for Portuguese trader Jorge Alvarez and inscribed with his, his name and the date 1552, upside down, around its shoulders, and you should be able to see that on that top image. Fewer than 10 vases survive with this inscription. They have varying decoration on the sides. Here, a Persian style lotus meander. Alvarez had joined about 200 other Portuguese on an island off the South China coast called Xiongchuan Island. The Chinese interpretation of its Portuguese name, St. John's Island. There they did business with Chinese junk traders who would call at the island. Alvarez and Francis Xavier, of course, a founder of the Jesuits, had met in Malacca, an event Xavier recorded in a surviving letter. And Alvarez hosted Xavier when he came to Xiongchuan Island in 1552, same year of the Vaz order. Xavier, who had established successful Jesuit missions in Goa and Japan, soon after co-founding the order in Rome in the 1530s, was most anxious to reach China, the biggest prize of all, of course. But sadly, while awaiting permission to enter China, he died in Alvarez's bamboo hut. To this day, there's a small Catholic church and a shrine to St. Francis Xavier on Shangchuan Island. Other religious brethren soon followed the Jesuits to Asia. This large jar displays the Franciscan crossed arms symbol Franciscans were in Goa by 1517, 
and later established themselves in Indonesia, Japan, New Spain, and in the Philippines, where by 1580, a Chinese diaspora of artisans had settled to supply the Europeans with carvings and paintings. The jar could have been ordered from Manila by any of these Franciscan communities. The Protestant Dutch, when they came along later, also ordered religious porcelains like the little flask at top right. And Jesuits remained active in Asia, some even at the court of the first Qing emperors, as you all know, until they were finally expelled in 1774. Life at court was difficult for the Jesuits, but they persevered as their status there allowed their brethren to preach throughout the country. Père Dantricol, for example, who wrote the famous 1720s letters detailing Chinese porcelain production, was stationed in Raozhou, the prefecture in Jiangxi province that oversaw Jing de Zhen. But it was certainly not just the Christian world that craved the high-fired, lustrous blue and white porcelain that only Chinese kilns could produce at this time. China had long interacted with a number of Islamic countries, and they were some of the earliest consumers of Jing de Zhen porcelain. In addition to the overland trading routes on which porcelain was born on camelback, it, would, it was encased in dried mud to prevent breakage along the route, Arab maritime traders were active all around the Indian Ocean, and the remarkable 14th century voyages of the Chinese Muslim Admiral Zheng He carried thousands of porcelains as far as the Arabian Peninsula and East Africa. In China itself, there were Muslim communities and numerous mosques, one of which may have commissioned this large pair of mosque lamps, which of course I'm showing you upside down. They would have been suspended from metal rims with chains. A crescent-shaped kendi made in the late 15th or early 16th century was part of the many trade ceramics made for Muslim communities in Southeast Asia or the Philippines. An Asian ship of this period sank off the Philippine coast with a whole cargo of similar pieces. A little 19th century oil lamp echoes a form known since the Shwanda period and a Wanli period tile is inscribed with Quranic verses. Other early special orders of porcelain from China were made for practical use. Among the rare examples in the collection is a group of 17th century apothecary jars inscribed with the names of their contents from lemon oil to euphrasia to myrtle oil. In this era, every palace, every monastery, even every large ship featured an apothecary filled with the herbal remedies that made up medicine at the time. Many of the herbs themselves hailing from the Middle East or Asia and part of the lucrative maritime trade. Most of the many necessary jars used in Europe were of course tin glazed pottery and you've all seen those, but some were made in Chinese and later Japanese porcelain, a very few of which were inscribed. We've been able to identify just seven different known patterns of Chinese inscribed apothecary jars, most with just a single surviving example, although originally all would have been in sets. Now, as the 17th century went on, the Portuguese who had been so in the vanguard and the Spanish who followed were joined in Asia by the Dutch, who over the ensuing decades became the dominant European presence in Asia. The Dutch had a much more commercial approach than the church state ventures of the Iberian countries. And they soon went beyond the armorial or religious orders of the Portuguese and Spanish to commission wares for their prosperous home market with its more widely diffused wealth. The famed public-private partnership known as the VOC established its headquarters in Batavia, now Java, and Amsterdam became the source of Asian porcelain for the rest of Europe. Augustus the Strong, for example, the famously obsessed collector who ruled Saxony, sent his agents to Amsterdam to acquire treasures for his royal collection. By the 1630s, the Dutch were ordering porcelain from Jing to Jen in fashionable European shapes for the dining table, which would be conveyed through drawings or metal or wooden models. Mustard pots 
like these were among their very first commissions. These rare early salts echo forms found in Dutch silver of the period. This rare pair of wine bottles from the last quarter of the 17th century was made in a European glass form, as were these two transitional period gin bottles. Pouring vessels for water or wine were made for many different markets. A handsome Kong Shi Yuer recalls a form from classical antiquity, although instead of a puta, puto head on its side, we have a Buddhist lion. There we see him. An elegant Kong Shi period Yuer of flattened pear shape was modeled after South Asian Indian metalwork, while a 16th century Ewer that once had a slender spout and handle was then adopted with tombak mounts for use in the Islamic world as a double spouted Turkish style bottle. Reminding us again of the global network engaged in this trade. Back in Europe, although increasing numbers of Chinese porcelain were arriving in the 17th century and some of them useful wares, it was still a luxury product in the province of the wealthy and blue and white, typically alongside Asian lacquer or its imitations, often form part of fashionable decor. Led by such early tastemakers as Amalia von Salms, wife of the Prince of Orange, and Alethea Howard, Countess of Arundel in England, special porcelain rooms or porcelain cabinetta became a must have for the royal or aristocratic house, a phenomenon that was particularly long lasting in Northern Europe. Interestingly, many of the wares used to ornament these rooms were made as functional, not decorative pieces, bowls and cups and dishes. Many of you will have seen the famed porcelain room at Charlottenburg that I'm showing you here with its porcelain bowls employed as hats for the 3D Chinese figures. But other Chinese porcelains were made purely as room embell embellishment like this wonderful pair of wall sconces in a Dutch metalwork shape two of just about half a dozen known. And again, Chinese porcelain as interior ornament was not by any means a phenomenon in Europe only. The iconic Artable Shrine in Northwest Persia, now Iran of course, was established by Shah Abbas in 1611 and he gifted the shrine with his extensive porcelain collection. So it's a time capsule. Many of us have seen the famed John Alexander Pope 1956 catalog of this important collection, but few have visited the shrine to see the walls of porcelain shaped niches that stretch to the ceiling to hold the Chinese porcelains in a tradition known in the Middle East and India as Chinikana, Persian for Chinese room. Once you are alert to it, you will notice niches of Chinese porcelain in the background of many Persian and Indian paintings, as we see in this charming 19th century glass painting of two noble Indian ladies. Chinese blue and white animals had a universal appeal, although they might be viewed through different lenses. A wrinkly elephant that res resembled, that represented exoticism to Western eyes, for example, would of course have strong Buddhist connotations for an Asian observer who would know that the last incarnation of the Buddha before he was born human was as a white elephant. Figures were made in blue and white too, many for the local market, but some decidedly for export to the West like Mr. Nobody, who I show you here. This depiction of Mr. Nobody, a caricature of the hapless average man is based on the frontispiece of a play that had been published in 1606. Decades later, an English trader with a sense of humor must have ordered a group of them to be retailed back in England. Fewer than half a dozen survive. One was visible in the 1904 photograph of the Duchess's closet at Ham House, and scholar Patricia Ferguson was able to identify it on a 1739 invoice in the Ham archives. Now, Mr. Nobody brings us to the English involvement in the China trade. The English had watched the enormous success of the VOC with great envy. But what with their own civil war to contend with and other impediments, they didn't really get trade with Asia going in earnest until late in the 17th century. One of the very first special commissions of porcelain by an Englishman 
was a set of jardiniers ordered by Sir Henry Johnson, a very wealthy shipbuilder whose shipyards on the Thames, right in the center of London, I'm showing you here. The collection has not just one, but two of these pots. The square one was found at an auction in England after it had been discovered tucked away in a garden shed next to the longtime Johnson country estate. Armorial porcelain being comparatively easy to date precisely and attribute to a specific owner or family provides a fascinating picture of changing fashions and differing national tastes and practices. And the substantial armorial holdings of the Freelingheisen collection offer us an unusual opportunity to study these wares across a broad spectrum rather than siloed English, Dutch, Portuguese, etc. As Angela Howard relates in her essay on her book, the collection includes examples of nearly every blue and white armorial pattern made for British patrons, who were by far the largest consumers of armorial porcelain, as well as nearly every Dutch, the next by volume, and Portuguese. All are shown in the book in chronological order rather than by country. The beautifully painted pair of plates at top left was made for VOC official Johannes Kamphaus in about 1683, while the early Dutch order beneath them, probably for the Potkin family, had punning arms showing a pot, unfortunately painted upside down on some of the plates. A number of Portuguese sets of the Kongxi period display the densely packed floral borders of the top center plate one of several similar sets ordered by members of the Coelho family who were active in the Portuguese empire. Florentine Lorenzo Genori, who had business interests in Macau and Goa, ordered a set of armorial plates through the Portuguese with the same style borders. At bottom center, we see three different services, all blue and white, ordered by the Grill family in the third quarter of the century who also had, by the way, services in colored enamels, which was increasingly the practice by that time. In 1752, Horatio Walpole, a nephew of the famous prime minister, ordered his set of armorial dishes shown at top right through his younger brother, a captain in the East India Company. Very unusually, as you can see, its arms are on the back while the front is in a Japanese Kakiemon style, which would have been somewhat retro in 1752. And one of the very few blue and white Portuguese services from later in the century, both the Spanish and the Portuguese generally preferred richly enameled porcelain once that became available, as the arms of a canon from the da Silva family, most likely made for Manuel Joaquin da Silva as the shapes of the matching serving pieces are decidedly from his period. Personalized inscriptions, as we saw with Jorge Alvarez, continued to be another way to closely associate oneself with fine Chinese porcelain. A typically lovely pair of Kongxi period plates, one shown at top left, are from an extremely unusual set with the family name on their backs. At top center, a dish from the 1780s shows an Armenian monogram. Armenia was split between Persia and the Ottoman Empire at this time, and Armenians were active in the China trade. Also in the 1780s, two members of the Irish establishment ordered beautiful, beautifully painted services with very unusual depictions of their arms and their honorary chains were used as borders, as you see on these two big shaped dishes. And again, this phenomenon was not restricted to Europe. Angela Howard was able to identify M. N. Meta, whose name appears on this well and tree platter, as a Calcutta-based Parsi with an import business and offices in Guangzhou. He ordered inscribed porcelain in about 1900 his retailer, presumably having his name painted on the backs. At far right are dishes from two different sets inscribed presented by Fong Pak Lu. 
Fong Pak Lu and his partner Li To Ming established an import-export business in Guangzhou in 1906. Dr. Wright had been the headmaster of his Hong Kong school, and Arthur Brown was a Hong Kong colonial official. Today, Li and Fung is a global conglomerate, with Fung Pak Lu's grandson as its chairman. But special order porcelain, with coats of arms or inscriptions or other European decoration, was a tiny percentage of the Chinese porcelain trade, which itself was only a very small percentage of the overall trade in Chinese goods. Porcelain represented just five to 10% of European trading cargoes. And most of that porcelain was comprised of commercial generic wares. Specially ordered commissions could include Asian sites that had become familiar to Chinese traders, like this depiction of a novel drawbridge gate in Batavia. Taken from views of the city that had been drawn by Johann Neuhaf when he visited uh, Asia and that were then published in 1682. Chinese porcelain painters were well familiar with copying a two-dimensional print onto a ceramic body, especially after the many 17th century wares decorated at private Jingdezhen kilns after woodblock prints of popular novels or plays like this 1640 example from the Romance of the Western Chamber. Prints provided an easily accessible and transfer transferable source of imagery. French fashion prints by the Bonar brothers of Paris were quite popular in both France and the Netherlands. In the late 17th century and made their way onto a number of high style Chinese export porcelain. Now, most so-called European subject Chinese porcelain was decorated with mythological scenes, the gods and goddesses and their exploits being as familiar as sports and Hollywood stars are to us today. Some of the rarer subjects in the Frelinghuysen collection include this remarkable vase with its continuous scenes of Westerners on board ship and coming ashore. Its only comparables are several large scale pieces found in a shipwreck off Bintan Island in Indonesia. It must have been a unique commission. This very rare plate displays one verse of a French country love song. Just a handful of related plates and dishes are known. They show three different song verses, but who ordered them and why remains a mystery. Similarly, this plate is one of just 13 card plates known, all decorated with the eight of spades. One is in the Rijksmuseum, one is in this collection, and the other 11 are in a Dutch house museum, and we have no idea who ordered them or why this card had special meaning to him or her. But of course, Europe was hardly the only foreign market for Jingdezhen porcelain, as we've already seen, and most of us are familiar with the Chinese tea wares made for Japan in the second quarter of the 17th century. The imperial kilns had been closed by the Wanli emperor in 1608 as a cost-cutting measure. And amidst the tumult of the impending civil war in China, private kilns were delighted to supply wares for the tea ceremony to their Asian neighbor, where Chinese ceramics had long been prized. Chinese merchants, like the Dutch, were allowed to continue their endeavors in Ch Japan, even after the Tokugawa shogun had expelled most other foreigners in the first decades of the 17th century. Much less known than the 17th century Kosmetsky tea wares is a very interesting group of 19th century porcelains made in China for the Japanese market. The Chinese merchant community in Nagasaki restricted to their Tojin Yashiki neighborhood, just as the Dutch were restricted to Dejima Island, seemingly seized an opportunity to supply porcelain to a Japanese domestic market that had become more prosperous very late in the 18th century. A number of pieces in Japanese taste shapes were made in the Jiaqing, Jiaqing and Daoguang periods, some marked and many decorated with the late Ming style paintings and poems 
that were still popular in the very conservative Japanese society with its antiquarian tastes. Famed collector William Beckford, writing about porcelain in 1819, said, quote, the Japanese import much of theirs from China, their own products being horribly dear. They have very few makes of the best quality and it takes a long time to make them. And another market important to the trade in Chinese ceramics over the century was that of the many countries of Southeast Asia, which included a number of Islamic kingdoms where the large shallow dishes made at the Zhongzhou kilns on the Southern coast of China and long known in the West as Swata wares, were highly desirable. The VOC, the Dutch company, did a brisk business distributing these wares, as did Chinese junk traders, and they too are represented in this collection. A rare pair of Southeast Asian market dishes show the shadow puppets that are particularly associated with Java and Bali. And of course, the Frelinghuysen collection also features Japanese export porcelain, providing a rare opportunity to examine the Japanese material alongside its Chinese counterparts. The Dutch really jump-started this trade as the only Europeans remaining in Japan after 1640. By this time, Chinese society was in some turmoil with the impending fall of the Ming, with battles eventually reaching even the streets of Jingdezhen. And yet in Europe, demand for Asian porcelain was only increasing. In 1650, official VOC orders began for the Japanese porcelain that the Dutch sought to replace the unavailable Chinese, orders totaling as many as several hundred thousand pieces a year. Chinese junk traders carried tens of thousands of additional pieces from Nagasaki to Batavia, where the VOC was headquartered, as well as to the English in Amoy and the Spanish in Manila. These orders represented a huge volume for the Japanese kilns, which were tiny in number by comparison to the behemoth of Jingdezhen. But still, both the VOC and private Dutch traders managed to commission pieces as they had done in China in European shapes and with European taste decoration, as we see here. And these special orders included armorial porcelain. Jugs in this German stoneware form were made for several Dutch families in the last quarter of the 17th century. The handsome blue ground dish was made for the Vandermage family of Dordrecht, who also had a set of Japanese armorial dishes made in colored enamels. The huge dish at right, it's 21 and a half inches, is one of a small group known all with blank shields. It seems that an enterprising Dutch trader had the group made, intending to sell them on to arms bearing families in the Netherlands who could have the details of their arms added, but apparently very few took him up on this offer. And the very rare inscribed tea bowls at top take us into the first decades of the 19th century, when an Amsterdam to Batavia mailboat captain, Jacob Duff, married Duverka Hofker. Bill Sargent was able to find their names recorded in a rather obscure Dutch maritime register, which was an exciting moment for us. And as these tea bowls show us, quite a lot of interesting material was being made in Japan in the 19th century, even though the volume of Japanese export had fallen off considerably once the Chinese kilns started back up again under the Kangxi Emperor. And a good part of the 19th century Japanese production was decorated with Westerners curious figures in dress that was decidedly old fashioned by this time, often shown with their pipes or small dogs and sometimes called duchies in the Netherlands. A Kawahara Kega painting of the early 19th century shows us a typical example of these depictions. Though these wares are often lumped in with export, they were in fact largely made for the domestic market. As a closed society, the Japanese were enormously curious about foreigners who they could only glimpse from the other side of the Dejima Causeway or by lining the roads to the capital during the annual VOC pilgrimage. Duchies, Western ships, wrinkly elephants and camels, both animals had been brought to Japan by Europeans, all were figures of fascination. 
the bowl at top left is inscribed twice with the name Hollander, a bit garbled on one side, while the dish at bottom left is a true cultural mashup. It's a Japanese dish with a European figure who sits in a Chinese style garden with a Chinese brush and ink cake. The last category of the Frelinghuysen collection I'm going to share with you today is a significant group of wares that were made in China for the Thai court in the later 19th century. Thailand was a relatively stable and prosperous country with long-standing diplomatic and commercial ties to China. There was a large and influential Chinese diaspora in Thailand. In 1691, an English resident there, George White, wrote, quote, this place's merchants who are keepers and traders for the king are all Chinese, end quote. Chinese porcelain was long exported to Thailand. In the 18th century, much of that was colored enamel ware. You've probably all seen it. Made to Thai test, taste and called Ben Chirong. That's the name for Wutsai in a Thai dialect, although the term is used for all enameled wares. But in the later 19th century, once the kilns at Jingdejin had been rebuilt after the Taiping Rebellion's destruction, there was a last great flowering of Chinese porcelain in Thailand. Rama V, who I show you here, attained full majority in 1873, and he was a passionate admirer of blue and white. He led a fashion for Chinese blue and white among the Thai elite, sponsoring collector exhibitions and competitions, and these wares flowed into the vast temples and palaces of Thailand. Among the most interesting of the Thai market porcelains is a group of tea wares ordered in 1888 with the royal monogram. The king commissioned a cousin, Prince Prawit Chumsai, to design about a dozen different versions of his monogram. And then he requested large tea sets in each design, each piece to bear his royal reign mark and the 1888 date. Here we see four of the monogram patterns, two of them on the distinctive water bottles with domed covers that are part of a typical Thai tea set. Cold water was served alongside the hot tea in Thailand, very sensible practice in a hot tropical climate. And here are three more of the royal monogram patterns, the bottle, a close variant of the one on the previous slide, but these pieces are not actually part of the royal sets. It seems that a leading Thai Chinese merchant ordered a large number of tea sets matching the royal order, but marked with his brand name, Jin Tong Fa Ji. When the porcelain arrived back in Thailand, the king learned of it and he was not pleased. It was only after the king's death that these sets were released from customs and made their way onto the art market. The character Tong in this merchant's brand mark has caused a lot of confusion, leading to attributions to an auspicious hall or studio. In fact, this was the name of a family firm run by Lord Baraboon Kosakorn, and it's found on a very large number of Thai market porcelains from this period. He was one of a handful of Thai Chinese elite who dominated the very lucrative rice trade with China. Thailand had exported a great deal of rice to China since the 1720s, and the Thai ships sent north loaded with rice often returned from Guangzhou with cargoes of Chinese porcelain, each with its respective brand name marks. Guangzhou, with its 13 Hongs, as they had appeared in the second quarter of the 19th century, was in fact a favored subject for Thai market porcelains. Here we see it on a large water cistern, one of four large cisterns in the collection. In the past, this subject has led many observers to believe that the pieces were intended for the American market and made earlier in the century. This rooster terrine though, is painted with a classic Chinese subject, the pavilion of Prince Tang, the famous Tang Dynasty landmark not far from Jing to Zhen. Five different animal terrines or large figures have been recorded with this very similar decoration. All, no doubt, made for the Thai market in this later 19th century period. 
So I'm going to leave you in the 1880s with this fascinating group of Thai market wares, having shown you 88 pieces from the collection. We published 525 in the book, 300 of them with full discussion, and the remaining 225 in an illustrated compendium with briefer entries. But I hope that this introduction to the incredible Freelinghuisen collection has convinced you that Asian blue and white export porcelain does indeed have many stories to tell. Thank you. Becky, enormously interesting. When you first went and were invited to go in to see the collection, what was your reaction when you walked into the door? <laughs> it is overwhelming, as you all got a glimpse of from the few room shots I showed you. There is porcelain everywhere, and it's it's all interspersed in the most wonderful way. Uh, Thai market pieces next to late Ming rarities and little charming things everywhere. You just want to pick up everything and it's impossible to take it all in, in one visit. So although I'd seen it over the years, a number of times, it really wasn't until we started this book project that I could even begin to realize how deep the collection really is. And with that kind of quantity and that overwhelming um, subject matter and variety, how did you react when Rodney said, gee, would you like to do a book or was that your <laughs> idea? It was, I mean, it was so exciting. It was such a treat to work on. There were, there are a lot of rare things in this collection that I never had the opportunity to research. I read the books, of course, generally, but because they never come into sale, um, I never had a real reason to sit down and spend serious time with them. So that was a great, great pleasure. And then a lot of the little sidebar categories that people just don't know about, like the Thai market material, the 19th century Japanese export. Um, there are a lot of things I didn't have time to show you tonight that reflect English. Once English and German and French factories start making porcelain, a lot of Chinese porcelains get made that copy those factories with this crazy back and forth of influences. Um, that was a really fun category to spend time with. Um, it just, it went on and on and on. It was really a huge project and it took me quite a while to get my arms around how best to try to present it to readers in a way that um, would really be meaningful because of its great diversity. Well, I, I mean, it's astounding that you tackled the project and you got it. How long did this take? It took about three years. It was all during the pandemic though. So it was a wonderful way to stay connected to Chinese porcelain and to lots of people like you, Lark, who I consulted on various pieces. Um, so I, I was just thrilled to have that project when we were all stuck in our rooms at home. So I so I'm, I'm putting on my hat as a 16th, 17th century fellow who's working in the porcelain workshops in Jing De Jin, and I'm receiving the orders and I'm getting orders from Thailand. I'm getting orders from East Africa. I'm getting orders from um, Europe. I'm getting orders from all over the place, from Thailand, everywhere. And I also then think about the recipient, who is the Englishman that's very, very proud of his family arms, and he's been waiting for months to get, or let's say nearly a year, to get his huge table service. And it comes back and his arms are upside down and his name's misspelled. <laughs> do, you have, do you have any kind of records or anything have you read about where people are, you know, it's like ordering the sweater from Amazon right before Christmas it arrives and it's the wrong <laughs> color. So do you have, have you run across anything where people have made comments about this? I mean, you mentioned this about the Thai fellow putting the royal insignia on his, uh, you know, just commercial yes, wear. That was really naughty. And they're actually, 
the time marks are confusing. Luckily, there is one scholar who's done a lot of work on this, who's a, the descendant of one of these great merchants who became very, very wealthy establishment figures in Thailand. Because for a long, long time, I didn't show these this afternoon, but there are four different Thai brand name marks that appear over and over again on these porcelains. Um, and they've been misunderstood in the rest of the world. People, collectors in Bangkok may have understood, but they've been completely misunderstood. And since they use Chinese characters for their brand names, they constantly tried, you know, Western scholars or Chinese scholars would try to interpret these as auspicious names, even if it wasn't the one that has the character Tong, which is the most confusing of all. Um, and not understanding really when the material was made either. But there are many other things, Lark, that were made not specifically for a certain market, like the Swatow wares, those big dishes um, made in those kilns that were all along the Fujian coast um, and very handy, therefore, to the junk traders and even the Westerners. Um, they appear all over the world. They were they appear all throughout Southeast Asia, which was a huge market for them, but they also appear in the Netherlands. You find them in England, you find them in Spain, later, of course, America, in India, in the Arabian Peninsula. A lot of this porcelain was um, not made for a specific market, but kind of beloved by all. And even if you had your arms upside down uh -huh. and your name is and you were the buddy of Louis the Fourteenth, and you're going, oh my gosh, this is not <laughs> I didn't not address amusing. that. There are <laughs> so few examples of that mistake porcelain. I mean, normally, ninety-nine point nine percent of the time, the Chinese were very, very adept at interpreting what um, their clients wanted. They were great businessmen. It's one of the reasons why um, all all of these traders turned back to China once um, the Kangxi Emperor reestablished the kilns um, at Jing Dejen because they really, they were, it was a two-sided deal. They really wanted to churn this porcelain out and, and do good business. The Japanese were a little more standoffish about the whole thing. Um, they really weren't quite sure, the, as well as the physical limitations. Their kilns were much smaller in number, you know, smaller countries, smaller, uh, less access to the materials, the raw materials, and so forth. How do you how do you distinguish what was intended for what market if it's not absolutely uh, obvious? Good question. Some things are obvious. Obviously, shape is a big give giveaway because functions can be different. Um, rose water sprinklers used in um, Islamic countries where hand washing and, and cleanliness was always super, super important. Um, the Dutch tablewares, of course, are quite distinctive and um, many other things made for European countries that follow specific models of French silver or English silver, for example. But many others you can either guess at or they're the case of like the Swatta wares, like croc wares, um, they were made for everybody and they aren't, they aren't targeting, they weren't targeted to any particular market. So there's a mixture, I would say. And did the major, I, I know the majority of this merch from Jing to Jen, what other places were there? where they manufactured The vast majority was from Jing to Jen. In earlier times, there were a lot of celadons exported and whitewares, northern whitewares, celadons from the various celadon kilns. A lot of those you find in the early um, Middle Eastern collections. Um, they also made their way to Europe um, and India. Um, Blanc de Chine, would, or De Hua porcelain, again, made in Fujian province, so very accessible to traders along the South China coast there, um, is probably the most important example after Jing to Jen porcelain, the white porcelain wares that were made for the domestic market in China. They were made for Japan, 
where they were prized. All through the centuries, Japanese collectors and connoisseurs prized Chinese porcelain and Chinese utilitarian porcelain was also um, sold in to Japan. Um, and then uh, John Joe, we've also mentioned, uh, AKA Swatow, but other provincial kilns, things roughly made in parts of the country where they either didn't have the fine clays that they had in Jingdezhen or where they're, or where they didn't refine it to the extent that potters did at Jingdezhen to create this amazing white material. But more provincial kilns where things were fired instead of on saggers, they were fired on the floor on sandy surfaces to keep them from sticking. Um, so you get that rough bottom with the sand adhering. Those wares um, were also exported. I, I, I'm one of the questions from a, a viewer is about the marks and the seals that you've encountered on Kangxi porcelain. I know one, one gets images of uh, rabbits and sprigs of artismia leaf and other things, but what other things do you run into? And do you actually have seal marks or character marks? Some early export wares, Ming period, were marked with Chinese rain marks, obviously not imperial marks, but marks perhaps of the reigning emperor or auspicious marks The the, um, Magic fountain vases have auspicious marks. Um, you know, may the force be with you kind of thing. <laughs> Good wishes yeah. and long life kinds of kinds of marks. But uh, the Kangxi Emperor decreed that foreign eyes should not take in the, the Chinese, the um, important Chinese characters. So that's why during that period, the convention of just an auspicious pictogram, a rabbit, a linger fungus, a magic magic mushroom, um, a jade chime shape, or um, a flower head. Those marks came to be used to just sort of signify this is a lovely thing, um, but not a rain mark. Those were sp specifically forbidden. I, and you and I had a conversation about how interesting it is that these marks are appearing on the underside of vessels and yes. uh, how that relates to the current use. If you go buy a dish from Tiffany, you turn it over, what do you see? It says Tiffany and Company on the underside yeah. of the dish. And it's something we just take for granted, but we don't really think where did that originate? And so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of postulating at this moment that Maybe this is where that that happened. It's very curious. And yes, whether they were following the concept of, of Chinese marks, which since China made the first porcelain, as our viewers probably all know, Europe did not have or any Western country or any other country. Vietnam made some hard paste porcelain. Japan early in the 17th century began to make hard paste porcelain. Nowhere else was it made until the 17 teens, potters at Meissen in Germany um, began to sort of come to an understanding, which by the way, was greatly amplified by the Jesuit Père d'Entrecol's long, long letters he wrote back to France where he really delineated, really with his Jesuit scientific mind, he was fascinated by it all, but it ended up being corporate espionage because he sent back basically the formula for how you create true or hard paste porcelain. And uh, so therefore during the course of the 18th century, the European factories um, developed that and it became for a time much more fashionable than Chinese porcelain, which had been the only porcelain for such a long time. Um, and I think and what happened perhaps is those crazy instances where you get Bavir under the, the Kangxi dish or the Walpole coat of arms underneath. And there's another example, um, beautiful dish at the Met with the French arms, French family arms and gilt and grisaille baskets of flowers on, front, on the front. Um, to me, it's always seemed like in the same way all armorial porcelain is an, uh, 
a desire to associate yourself very, very closely with this very elite refined material that comes from so far away. Yeah, it, I, I, and one of the other questions, of course, we all take it for granted, every blue and white, but why blue? That's a very I good question. We, it's why, chemistry. Why? <laughs> yes, it's, it's chemistry. chemistry, but they, but they, oh, they had access to color. They had oh. access to color. Yeah. Uh, but it really grabbed the attention, not just of China, but everyone. It's it's chemistry because the cobalt is the only color, as you know, that can be fired um, under the glaze in one firing. It can withstand the very high temperatures of the original firing. And the other colors um, need to be, which uh, need to be fired separately at a, at a lower temperature. So it's a cheaper process. It also was just the contrast of it was highly appealing. It develops probably out of brown and cream wares in the north. Um, the potters develop the a facility with the contrast kind of painting, and they come to Jing to Jen, and it's cobalt, which comes it's partly mined in China partly mined in the Middle East in various periods, depending on its cost. It was very costly. At the kilns in Jing Dijen, it was locked up and, and inventoried every night. And there was a certain person in charge of, of its supply. Um, so the, the material itself wasn't so cheap, but it was the process that you could have one firing and, and produce this beautifully lustrous glazed decorated piece you know it, as one has spent so many years all of us in our various pursuits and enthusiasms about asia but with um porcelain you've you've handled so much material and there's it takes a lot to surprise you but i bet you had some surprises when you delved into this you want to share them <laughs> Ah, uh, I certainly did many, and um, Rodney was a great source of information for me on some of these things, which he spent so many years focusing on just blue and white, whereas I was pulled all over the map all the time. As although I've always loved blue and white, that um, he developed a really specialized knowledge. So there were things like. I don't know, little, we show them in the book, but I don't have them in my presentation, little counters with characters on them, numbers in Chinese characters, little round white Jing to Jen porcelain, or they could be from a provincial kiln, it's hard to tell, that are called B that were used in gambling. We know all Asian countries, gambling is huge. And these were just a regular commercial product. They made zillions of them. And people in Southeast Asia collect them. I'd never seen such a thing or heard of it. You know, they're just all kinds of crazy things in the collection. They're really, really fun. Oh, well, you know what? It's been a pleasure, Becky, to have you share this with us. Thank you very much. And we are all beneficiaries of the uh collecting efforts of Rodney and um, his enthusiasm and your extraordinary expertise. So oh, thank, you. Of it, Appreciate that. thank you. We're so pleased that we we're able to present this and we encourage everyone again to look for our programs that will be coming up this March. And we hope to see you in New York, if not sooner. Thanks so much.